Well, I want to say it again. Good morning. Glad that you are here today. And also, as we've already presented that God is good, I want to identify with some of you who could be sitting here and you're going, I don't know if I think that God is good. Because there are some people who maybe haven't experienced that. And so I'm so glad that you are here today if you're in that category because I am confident because of who God is by the end of this experience, we corporately and you individually will be able to see that in fact, God is good. God is great. And people who realize that truth, those kind of people that realize that God is good tend to live more optimistically, they love like Jesus, and they lead with enthusiasm. I'm with a group of people and have been with a group of people since the middle of uh, April. We've been training for the uh, Hope Water International event that we will commemorate when we run either a half marathon or a full marathon two weeks from today. And we're doing that to raise money for a people group that is never identified by the United Nations as a group that needs water, but 1.3 to 1.5 million people do not have clean water, and we are raising funds to put in wells, and wherever we put in a well, we also put in a church with another organization that we work with. Isn't that great, the team that's doing that? No. In saying that, I want to say, some of you go, oh my word, running sucks, man. And there are days I would say that too. I do, but I want to tell you, it's absolutely incredible that the Hope Water team that's been training now for six months, whether it's muggy, whether it's sunny, whether it's raining, whether it's cold, we are out in God's creation and experiencing God's creation in a special, special way. And in that, we're going to be able to help a community, but before you can help a community, you got to be in community, and a lot of people are also reaching some goals. They're walking farther than they've ever walked. They're running farther than they've ever run. And they're also raising more money than they ever thought that they could raise for an incredible cause. And they're saying that life is good because physically and spiritually they're getting connected and they're experiencing life. And James, this brother of Jesus, uh, he, he has a similar perspective. And I know, and why I said what I said when I walked on this stage, that if some of you are skeptical, James was skeptical. He was the skeptical brother of Jesus. He was the eye-rolling brother of Jesus, like, oh, there he goes again. But he became an ambassador. James died for his brother because his brother Jesus died for him as Jesus died for you and me. And in that in and of itself, that shows that God is good. But what happened to James? When your brother predicts his own death and that he's going to rise again as resurrection, and then you see your risen brother, you believe. You believe. And for those of you who have not maybe been part of this, um, this series yet, you can catch all of the talks on our podcast and many of you, and for five weeks, we've been encouraging people to read the book of James, five chapters towards the end of the New Testament. I've had people come up to me and say, I've never read the Bible so much. I've never read James so much. And it's unbelievable as we're just focusing on that, what I'm learning. I'm loving that we've taken five weeks to concentrate just on one book. And we could have spent 15 weeks. And if you're reading the book of James... You go, James is so scatterbrained. He's like all over the place. And in a second, I'll give you the reason why I think he's scatterbrained. One minute he's talking about trials and how you face the trials with, with wisdom. And then he goes, hey, by the way, true religion is true religion is helping widows and orphans in their distress. And then he starts talking about prayer, but throughout the book, it's all about application. Don't just hear it, apply it. Faith without works is dead. And then he talks about prejudice and judgment. And then he comes back in with more action in the faith. And then he does a whole discourse on how to speak properly and how to speak unwisely. He talks about wisdom that's of God and 
Wisdom that is not of God. And he talks about humility. And then he talks about pride. It's just, it's so scatterbrained. But you know what I think happened? He was at eye rolling. Yeah, there he goes again. But then he said, Jesus is everything he said he was going to be and more. And all of a sudden, James just said, I don't know when I'm dying because I'm sold out to him. And he just starts writing frantically anything he remembered from Jesus because before that, he was not all in. And there is an urgency because James couldn't get enough of Jesus. And he saw that his way, because Jesus said, I am the way, and Christianity at the beginning was called the way. He said, I don't want to get in the way, and I just want to pave the way. And then with his frantic, just kind of scattered brain, he goes like this. Look here, you rich people. And you go, where did that come from? He had one of those fast thoughts again. Oh, yeah, I remember Jesus talked about, whoa, whoa, whoa. And that was a threat of Jesus. And James knew because he had spent enough time with his brother to know that attitudes towards this subject test the heart. Test the heart. And when you hear, look at the rich guy, you start looking around because you go, I'm not rich. And every one of us here could come up with 20, 25, 30 reasons why we're not rich. I drive a Honda, and it's like a 1980. I don't even have money to get Netflix. I buy my coffee at McDonald's because they can't afford Starbucks. I still have a Dell I haven't replaced my iPhone in like three or four years. I shop at Aldi. Yeah. <laughs> we should get royalties off of that now. <laughs> Can't remodel my kitchen, and God forbid my ice maker is broken. My kids share an iPad, and when we out, go out to eat, it's just because we have a gift card. And you know why that is? Because we always compare. Well, uh, James, James, at the very end of the book, he goes, hey, you rich people. We always compare because we'll always find someone who has more than us or someone who we think has more than us. Uh, tell me, who's this guy here that I'm going to pop up on the screen? Who is that? Can anybody help me out? Be it Jeff, yeah, the $131 billion man. Guy's worth 131 billion. Will you just say that? Billion. Go ahead, say it. Billion. Be the last time any of us will say it. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, he, he, you may know this guy. He owns that company called Amazon. He also owns the Washington Post, and he also owns a company called Blue Origin that is trying to make safe travel, uh, space travel common to just common everyday folk. He's about the only guy on God's earth that most would say couldn't say, I'm not rich. But what about Bill Gates? What about Oprah? I, I don't make what Oprah makes off her royalties. You, any of you watch Shark Tank? Shark Tank? Man, I'm, I'm not like those guys like Lori, man, and Robert, I'm, and Kevin, Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. All right, I didn't know if I was going to do it, but why not? <laughs> How many of you make more than $32,000 a year? Or if you're retired, you made more than $32,000 a year? Raise your hand. You're in the top 1% of the people in the world. Do you know what the National Bank claims is poverty level? those that make $1.90 per day. What's the minimum wage in this state now? Near $10. 
minimum wage. 9.9% of the people living live on less than $2 a day. Nearly half of the world's population live under $2.50 a day. And 80% of the world's population lives on less than, go ahead, say it with me, how much? Minimum wage per hour. When you and I see this, none of us should be saying, where's the rich guy? Because every day when we get up and brush our teeth and look in the mirror, we're seeing a rich person. Every single one of us in this auditorium. James is talking to you and to me, and little did he know that it would be so profound in 2019. The majority of you here, we live in unbelievable houses, townhouses, condos, whatever. And we, did anybody walk here today? No. Nope. We drove here today in vehicles, in the majority of people don't even have a vehicle, and we park our vehicles in a house. In fact, some of us have two, three, and four houses for our vehicles. We're rich. We're really rich. We go $4 lattes, which is more than what people make per day, and none of us here wonder if we have shoes to wear. We wonder if we can pick out the right shoes to wear with the outfit that we want to wear. And that's why James says, look here, you rich people. And for those of you who may not be convinced, that's why God wanted you here today because this is the thing about James. He was scatterbrained, but he was real, he's truthful, he's to the point, he's an urgency kind of guy, and little did he know through the power of God having him write his scatterbrained, urgent book, how applicable it would be for today. And this is what could be misread, and please do not misread this. James cares. When you read the book of James, James cares. James is the kind of guy that you would want on your team. Because James is the kind of guy who's willing to share the last 10%. Not to tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you need to know. That's James. Because more than anything, James was laissez-faire, gone, there he goes again. But he saw Jesus, and when he saw Jesus... He just was trying to help us on our journey to be more like Jesus. And when the tough shares are shared with us, whatever they are, it may be that very thing that is holding us back from becoming everything that God wants us to be and what ultimately we will feel the most fulfilled in. And that's why he says, look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the ter terrible troubles that are ahead of you. Listen to this. The very thing you may be holding on to may be the very thing that will tear you ultimately apart. In the context, if you read there in the fifth chapter as it goes on, it was written to landowners who had a lot, who dealt harshly with their workers, who were paying unfair wages and they would even cut wages to benefit themselves. They would do unscrupulous things to get ahead. There's a guy who attends this church who I'm getting to know and I see the way he treats his family. I see the way he treats his uh, workers. I'm following him a little bit on Facebook and he's a guy that doesn't say, how can I take from my workers, but how can I give more? James, James 
wants people to be fully engaged, not like he was when he had Jesus in his presence. It took James until Jesus died for him to realize who his brothers was, who was the savior of the world. He's not doing this out of spite or out of judgment. He's just saying, will you just be honest? You and I are rich. Would you say it? I am rich. Say it. I am rich. We're rich in the goodness of God. He's saying, would you live with open hands versus closed hands? His hands versus it's mine. That's the example that Jesus had, open hands. In the book of James, if you've been reading it, you know that it says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. What James is saying here when he gives that illustration about the landowners and little did he know how incredibly pertinent it would be today because we live in a wealthy environment, it's a bit of a disadvantage because it's an enormous, enormous obstacle to overcome because we're self-sufficient. James knew that this concept, this topic that we're talking about today will forever try to fracture your and my allegiance to Jesus. And that's why he says, your wealth is rotting away, your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags, your gold and silver have corroded. The very wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? You can't take anything. I can't take any of our stuff with us. I, I've got a buddy. I've never been around a guy like this before. The more he makes, the more he gives, the more he gives, the more he makes, the more he makes, the more he gives, the more he gives, the more he makes. He says, because I'm rich, I just want to give it away. Look at this. This would be one to take a picture of. Our love for God is illustrated, demonstrated, and authenticated by how well we love the people around us. I've said this before that I am absolutely convinced why a lot of people don't go on mission trips and compassion trips. It's really not the money. It's um, I have a love-hate relationship with compassion trips and mission trips. You go, what? You're the pastor. What? You, did you just say you have a love-hate relationship? Yeah. I go on compassion trips, and next year I'll take a group of people to Kenya to celebrate what you as a church have supported with Hope Water where we're putting in new wells. But I'll be very transparent, I don't like to go on those trips because they make me evaluate my own life so much. It's radically changed on what I keep and don't keep on what I buy and what I don't buy just, as, just in, the, in the clothing realm. Matthew... Another guy who was touched by Jesus says this, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. You can't load up your boat, you can't load up your RV, and you can't load up your U-Haul when you die. And Matthew and Jesus and James are getting to the heart of it. And this was so important to Jesus and so important to James. Jesus, some would say, second only to the love for God, spoke about things and possessions and stuff. It's the second most popular subject in the Bible. And look what Matthew goes on to say. And would you read this out loud with me? No one can serve two masters. I couldn't hear you. Would you read this out loud with me? No one can serve two masters. 
For you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one. Oh, no, keep reading with me. And despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Or another translation says this. You cannot serve both God and money. You can't serve both God and things, possessions. And Jesus and James and Matthew knew that the chief competitor for our heart and our devotion would be stuff, money, and possessions. I... um, We get cards sometimes and evaluations and say, we think you, Terry, talk about money too much. I can honestly tell you this. It's not to get more money. I know for fact, because I've experienced it in my own life, that the very thing that will hold us back from experiencing what God wants us to experience in our lives, the chief competitor of our allegiance and devotion to God is our things and our possessions. And I want you to be released of that so that you experience the power and the presence of God and see him work in ways that you could never ever, ever experience until you say, it's not mine, it's his. Anything I have is his. I'll do whatever he he wants with that which he's given to me. It's in that vein. I talked to another pastor this week, young pastor, and we were talking about this, that the only reason he cares, James cares, I care that you give, it tells the story of your heart. Tells the story of my heart. It's an accurate picture of how much we trust God. And if we're rich, we've been blessed by the blesser to be a blessing to other people. If all of the treasure is in possessions and things and what we have and have attained, as we just read, the loyalty is to earthly pleasures, whereas if we're open hands and we say, I'll use everything God has given me, I'll begin to think differently to benefit others, then it's a loyalty and devotion to the kingdom of God and to Jesus. So let me ask you this. How are you leveraging your resources for the benefit of others? How are you? You say, I don't know where to start. Just volunteer. Just start serving and loving other people and when you see a need, Respond to that need. I can honestly tell you that one of the highlights every two weeks for me and for my wife, but I take care of it, we talk about it is, is how can we give more to this church and after we've given more to this church, how can we give other places to benefit others so that they can see Jesus. If right now you throw in some cash, maybe you start saying, I'm going to monitor it, and maybe I only give 2% of my income, and I'm, I'm going to up that to 4%. Maybe um, if you see a need and you say, I can't respond to that need, you do something that is just ridiculous. 
and you say, but I feel God's leading me to do it. I, I, I don't want this to be a Terry and a Jeanette thing, but I want to tell you there's been times where there's just something recently that happened, and, and I don't want to go into it. But I just said, we as a church right now where we're at financially can't do it, and we're just, we're just going to do it. James cares because he knew that the very thing that could hold you and I back from experiencing God in a fuller way would be our things and our possessions. And Jesus risked everything, and when James saw it, he said, I won't let anything hold me back from showing my allegiance and devotion and he was literally stoned. Everyone here in Livingston and Oakland County, we live in the richest counties in the state of Michigan. We are so rich. So I'm going to ask you to do something. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you haven't G asked Jesus to come into your life. Jesus is not your Lord and your Savior, and you're not walking with him. You, don't have, you, 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 you can hear this. I'm not asking you to do it. Your first step is to just ask Jesus to come into your life so you can experience that goodness of God. But for weeks and months now, I've been asking you this. Will you just do this? Will you get up every morning and say, good morning, Jesus, and start with him? Before you look at a text, before you look at an email, before you just go, good morning, Jesus. And why add something this week and just go, Jesus, because of you, I'm so rich. I'm rich. And come from a focus of generosity versus scarcity. Open hands versus closed hands. And say, God, I'm going to trust you in ways I've never trusted you before. And you will experience God's presence and power like you never have before. I like a guy like James. who really cares. People who really care don't tell you what you want to know. They tell you what you need to hear. And us here in this auditorium in Heartland, Michigan, with a Howell mailing address, we are so rich and we have been blessed by the blesser to be a blessing to others. I am you are, say it with me, I am rich. Father God, use today not as a guilt trip, but for us to see that wherever we go, whoever we see, we're rich with what you've given us spiritually. We're rich with what you've given us resource-wise. We're rich with how we were broken and we're less broken than we were. We're rich because we can seek your wisdom rather than our wisdom. We are rich because we don't live without purpose. We live with purpose. We are so rich. May every person here who's never seen it before realize that when they go to Speedway to get gas, they can be a blessing to somebody else and just being a cheerful voice. Dear God, when we're at a Friday night football game, may we look at the ways that we can bless others, encourage others with a word, or maybe if we see a need, respond. Dear God, Thank you for this study in James. And thank you for what you're going to do because I believe people here 
came today wanting to hear from you and may we just be obedient. We pray it in Jesus' name, name above all names. Amen.